much, Sarah. Um, so our next uh, speaker would be Noah Cases. Uh, he's a legal, legal fellow at the NYU Fairman Center and the Brookings Institute. He'll be talking about experiences with broad legalization of two to four unit buildings. Um, thank you, Noah, um, please. Uh, oh, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, let me just get my slideshow up and running. All right, can you all see that? Great. So I was asked to talk about efforts at the, especially at the state level, but also at city levels to, to legalize what some people call missing middle housing or gentle density, two to four unit homes. Some people talk about this as ending single family zoning as well. You've probably heard that kind of branding. And the reason I was asked to talk about it is you all have legislation before your state legislature that would do exactly this. Um, so what your law would do is in any of your municipalities greater than 20,000 people, which is far from all of them in, in Rhode Island, you'd have to allow duplexes on basically all residential lots and up to four units in all residential areas, but not necessarily any lot. Local governments would still be able to sort of shape what those neighborhoods look like through their zoning codes, as long as the uh, accumulated set of regulations doesn't lead to what Sarah called death by a thousand cuts. It can't sort of unreasonably hinder the development. And this is really based very directly on what Oregon did. They were sort of the first in this space. Uh, the description of what they did is basically the same as what I just said, so there's no need to go through it, but it's something that's happening in a lot of places around the country. So this is California, where a law called SB9 said you can take your lot, you can slice it in two. Now you've got two lots, and on each of those, you can build a duplex. So depending on the size of your, of your lot, one unit can turn into up to four units. Uh, Maine, just like this month, passed a really big new law. Uh, it legalizes accessory dwelling units and duplexes statewide in designated growth areas up to four units per lot. Uh, statewide goals for how much housing each area has to produce, uh, additional density allowed for affordable housing, additional requirements to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, so this is exciting stuff and you can see that it's spreading from kind of high rent places like California to a state like Maine that maybe hopefully is getting a little bit more ahead of its problems than California, which is starting quite behind the eight ball. Uh, and there's cities doing this too. So this is Minneapolis. Uh, the pink was everything that was single family zoning. You can see it was most of the city in 2019 uh, among a suite of other changes, uh, some of which were actually, I think, much more important. Uh, they, they, everything in the pink, now you can build up three units. Um, and then this is Walla Walla, Washington, which I put in there because like, who cares about Walla Walla, Washington? Um, it's a small place kind of far from the action, but they've also completely eliminated single family only zoning. And the point is, if they can do it, surely you can too. Uh, and why is this happening now? Why is there action you know, from California to Maine? I think there's an understanding that the, the housing crisis is a supply crisis that while it isn't sufficient, uh, it is necessary to build a lot more homes for us to be able to afford our homes. Uh, there's an understanding that single family zoning has roots in a uh, planning ideology and moment that was racist, that was anti-immigrant, that was uh, very sexist, you know, sort of back at the turn of the last century. There's an understanding of the environmental benefits of density. So there's a lot sort of feeding into this, but what I wanted to spend the rest of the time talking about was sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages of this particular strategy, this sort of two to four unit legalization broadly compared to some of the other things like um, what Jesse and Sarah were talking about. And Jesse pointed out, you know, the MBTA communities law is really one of a suite of things that Massachusetts already has. You know, each of them does a slightly different thing and they work together. So what does this get you? What does this not get you? So one thing it gets you is that this is totally traditional. So these are three pictures from Rhode Island that I pulled. You know, one is triple deckers in Providence. You know, you know them, you either love them or hate them. And then just you know, some random duplexes I found in about 40 seconds on Google Street View in Cranston on the top right and Westerly on the bottom right. And the point is like, these are just normal, right? Like I could have picked ones that were even less obtrusive, but then you wouldn't even notice 
they were duplexes. You just have to count the mailboxes. So they could fit right into existing neighborhoods and, and maybe that's politically advantageous. Um, just to say in Rhode Island, one quarter of your housing stock is already in these two to four unit buildings. So that's a lot, right? That's a lot of people. Um, another reason is that it sort of changes the politics in a way that brings homeowners from being sometimes opponents of building new housing to sometimes being supporters of new housing. Not always, definitely not always. Uh, but the idea, this is California, is if you're building one additional unit on an existing lot, what you're building is maybe something that looks like what's on the right, you know, sort of a backyard cottage, and the benefits go to someone who's already in that community, votes in that community, calls their state legislator in that community. Um, different from sort of a larger apartment building that has to be assembled and built by a, a commercial developer. And so what you can see on the left is sort of a map of where all these accessory dwelling units were built in California just over a two year period. And sort of once they got the legal reforms right, they were building 15,000 a year up from essentially zero. Uh, so if you get it to work, it can really unlock uh, growth very broadly uh, and possibly popularly. And then the last reason is that I think that this can sort of shake loose the politics of zoning in a way that's really important. So this is uh, just an illustration of some zoning reforms in Portland, Oregon. Uh, you don't need to worry about the details, but the point is they go well beyond what the state required. So the state said your existing single family zoning is no good, uh, illegal now. But Portland didn't say, okay, we'll do the minimum that the state required. They, they made it their own, they went further, they're gonna try and build more housing. They put in things like affordability requirements in larger buildings where it can actually pencil out. They thought about parking, they thought about lot size, all of these things. And so sort of once you say, well, the status quo isn't any good anymore, I think there's room for local communities in the best case scenarios to really embrace this and make it their own. Uh, and something that is very broad that can, that can apply statewide is good for that kind of shaking loose the politics. Uh, San Diego is another great example that's just taken the California reforms and absolutely run with the football. But definitely not a panacea, there are weaknesses too. So this is a graph of new construction of housing in two to four unit buildings in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So I said the, the legalization of these three unit buildings was in tw mid 2019, the first full year was 2020. I don't see the difference on the graph from 2018 to 2019 to 2020. Uh, it just didn't do that much. And even if you attribute all of those 54 to the legalization, 54 is a small number. Minneapolis is actually doing great on land use, but there are reforms that affected parking and mid-sized apartment buildings on, on larger streets have been where the action is. Part of the reason is that Minneapolis didn't make a bunch of other dimensional changes. You know, how far do buildings have to be from the, from the lot line? How much parking is required? How tall can they be? All of those kinds of things. Uh, and so as a result, you can sort of, you can put two or three units in the same shape building uh, but that's not actually that advantageous uh, compared to legalizing the kind of buildings that duplexes and triplexes and townhouses more historically are. And I'm just going to show uh, Sarah's hometown of Houston here. This is what a lot of development looks like across Houston, these, these townhouses. Uh, and these are all single family lots, or most of them are, I think. Uh, they're not allowing three units per lot. They're saying one unit per lot real tightly in there. And there's something to that because we don't actually care how many people can live on a lot of land. A lot is an artificial legal boundary on paper. We care about what, how many people can live in our communities per, per acre or near transit or near jobs or in a school district, something that's real. Uh, so you units per lot matters to getting there, but we really care about how much actual construction is happening in physical space. Another downside of sort of this two to four unit legalization is it's a little too easy to see whether it works as a matter of sort of legal enforcement. So California, they're in the implementation phase, so it's Oregon, Maine isn't even there yet. And they're getting a lot of blowback in California. Uh, you know, local governments are coming up with the most ridiculous excuses or ridiculous barriers to these new duplexes. So our entire town is a mountain lion habitat. And if you build a duplex, it will endanger this endangered species. Single family homes 
mountain lions don't, they don't worry, they don't care about those. They just hate duplexes. I mean, total nonsense. Uh, the entire town is a historic district. There's one that said, if you build one of these new duplexes legalized by state law, you can't have any off-street parking and you also can't get an on-street permit uh, for parking. So you just can't have a car out in the suburbs. This one at the bottom left is another death by a thousand cuts. All of those are from one town uh, for these new duplexes. It's just impossible to build. Now the state AG is going after these and we'll see who wins. It's sort of, the AG has the law on its side, I think, but the local governments have numbers and they've got persistence and it might be trench warfare. So I'm optimistic that the implementation phase of Oregon, of California, of Maine is gonna go well, but it's not a done deal. And we don't sort of know exactly if this is the right strategy yet. And then the last piece is, is sort of where I started, which is that this is just one piece of a broader holistic housing strategy. So something that this sort of missing middle housing is not that good for is building housing fast, right? You know, if you're changing one unit to two and individual homeowners are doing it, maybe when they sell, maybe when they build up some equity, that's really different than a hundred unit building that can be built all in one go. Apartments, you know, more dense multifamily housing is a lot better for transit oriented development. You really want to put people where the transit is, not put a duplex where the transit is. It's better for below market rate housing and subsidized housing because it's really hard to get those subsidies and cross subsidies to pencil out in a two unit building. Whereas in an apartment building, we have the models to do that. So as you in Rhode Island think about this kind of um, legalization of a really important and traditional piece of our housing stock, uh, I say more power to you, Godspeed, uh, but also think about can you integrate a transit-oriented strategy that maybe aligns with what Massachusetts is doing because the MBTA goes into Rhode Island? Think about reforms to the Low and Moderate Income Housing Act, which is the, the sort of developer-led appeals process, which I believe you guys are actually already in the middle of like a commission rethinking. You know, there's lots, to, lots of strategies. There's no silver bullet because there's so many problems we've accumulated over the years with our outdated zoning that we need to fix all of them, which means lots of solutions, not just one. And if you wanna uh, reach out, my, my email address and Twitter handle are right here. All right, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the conversation part.